This is the Brew News. Hello and welcome to the Brew News. Speaking with us today is a writer whose novels have given words to the contradicting feelings of Asian migrants in the West. Mohsen Hamid, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, let us start with the first question, obviously, which comes to our mind. Tell us about your book, The Last uh, White Man, and why did you feel it was so important to be penned? So The Last, last White Man um, is a story about a young man uh, named Anders. And uh, he wakes up uh, in an unnamed uh, country. Um, and he's dark. But when he went to bed the night before, he was light. And he tells his girlfriend, Una, uh, and his father, and Una's mother, and these four characters navigate a life in a small town as everybody starts to become dark. And society you know, starts to fall apart, and then other things happen. And, um, and in a way, the novel was, was born out of two different things. One was, I think, the rise of uh, tribalism today. You know, people retreating into their identity of, of being, you know, of one religion or one race or one ethnicity and excluding other people. But the other part of it um, uh, has to do, I think, with my own experience, you know, living in, in New York and London after 9-11, when, you know, I didn't change. But one day I woke up and, you know, to be a brown guy with a Muslim name went, meant one thing. And the next day it seemed to me something completely different. So you were being stopped at the airport, people were getting up on the bus and changing seats, people seem to be scared of you. Um, and so in a way, Andrew's experience is like that. One day he wakes up and everybody looks at him differently. Oh, that's, that's quite interesting because the first novel that you had come around, which the, uh, a movie was made, uh, you had the reluctant uh, fundamentalist. Yeah. Now that showed a debate on you know uh, what is going on inside a well-taught a uh, Muslim man, you know, who's experienced that same current development around him, right? Now, in the current scenario, the same debate is prevalent among the uh, youth of minorities in different forms. So are you planning to come up with some more titles as an extension of this issue? Well, I think, you know, each of them comes at things in a different way. So The Reluctant Fundamentalist was about a young man named Cengiz who is confronting sort of a question of, you know, what side he's on um, in the post-2001 environment. Right. But it's also a novel very much about how we are um, uh, suspicious of each other, how easy it is to make somebody suspicious of somebody else, how the reader can begin to view this interaction between Cengiz and this unnamed American stranger that he meets as a deadly and dangerous interaction, even if nothing has happened that makes it deadly or dangerous. And my previous novel, Exit West, was a story about migrants uh, in a world where these doors open and suddenly everybody can move countries. And it's a novel really about how we are all migrants actually. And it's a mistake to think that some are natives and some are migrants mm. because over the course of our lives, we migrate through time. You know, none, none of us have lived in 2023 before. We are all new arrivals in 2023. We're all migrants here in a sense. And, um, and so I guess each of my novels ap approaches these things in different ways. Um, uh, I do think that young people today are confronted with you know, very difficult questions about um, change and about what group you belong to and about uh, assimilation or, or separation. Um, I also think we're confronted with very interesting questions from technology. So one of the things that technology does is um, the culture of machines is to sort into zeros and one. It's, it's sort of a binary culture. And that zero and one culture says, you know, are you a zero or are you one? Are you like me or are you not like me? And I think that we've now started to come into a human society where we're asking this question, are you like me or are you not like me? And a small difference of opinion can become the basis for saying, no, you know, you're not like me. You know, I mean, Pakistan and Indians are such a good example of this. Pakistan and Indians, you know, Pakistanis and Indians are probably more similar than, than most neighboring countries. Of course. Um, and yet we've applied this zero one binary to imagine that we are you know, uh, very different. But of course the same would apply to people you know, living in the Gulf, people living in Europe, Russians and Ukrainians, you know, are a bit like Pakistanis and Indians. They have so much in common mm -hmm. and yet they're engaged in this horrific uh, war. Is about um, uh, what happens if you can't tell the difference anymore? What if you don't know if somebody is like you or not like you? What if you can't tell if somebody is a zero or a one? You know, what happens to society then? Mm -hmm. 
Now, tell me something, I mean, you were talking about, um, obviously, uh, we are talking about Exit West, you were talking about uh, Reluctant Fundamentalist. Now, Reluctant Fundamentalist was, you know, a kind of a real story, if I can say so. Yeah, and then now you have The Last White Man, which is, you know, quite opposite, it's more towards the surreal. So you're writing in, uh, I mean, it's a completely different genre, right? So how do so, you manage to cover it all? So the thing is, all of my novels look like realism with a small crack. Yeah. So, for example, in Moth Smoke, it's my first novel. It was a realistic novel, except that the reader is cast as a judge and all the characters are presenting their stories as though they're on a trial with the reader judging them, which, of course, is a kind of surreal element. In The Rotten Fundamentalist, again, it looks real, but it's mm. not entirely real because would these two characters really sit you know, in a cafe in Lahore and have this conversation all evening? And you know, it's a bit like a, like a one-man play. Mm -hmm. How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, again, was sort of a realistic novel, but um, no historical time passes. This character goes from being a child to being an old man, but it's all set in the present. And in Exit West, everything is just like our world, except that you can move from place to place. And so similarly, right. in The Last White Man, I would say it's a novel that engages very much in realism, but with one small difference, people are changing color. So I think what sometimes happens is that we can see our reality more clearly if we just look at it from a slightly different angle. So what I do in my books is I take reality, maybe change one or two elements and leave everything else as what you would call realism. So they're not, I suppose, truly surreal. Um, they are still very much realism, but the realism right. with a little, little tint. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's a glass of water with a drop of blue food coloring. It's not that the glass yeah. of water has become, you know, uh, a glass of honey. Right. Yeah, but, but earlier it was more real and a bit, like you said rightly, a tint of surrealism. So are we expecting something in the future, your books, uh, which are more surreal and a, you know, a hint of realism? <laughs> it's a good question. I, I don't know. You know, I, I think what happens is that the exact measure of how much of this unreal to include depends on the project. Um, uh, I, I'm actually, I have this idea for a book next. Which I don't want to say much about it. I, I hate talking about books before they're written, but um, which is significantly less unreal um, than the last two books have been. So I don't think it's necessary. I'm heading in a trajectory where, you know, in the next novel, everybody will be an octopus or something. I think I think oh. that uh, <laughs> uh, I could I could very well wind up writing yeah. something more like Smoke or like right. fundamentally. I think the octopus story is already taken by Penguins of Madagascar, I believe. <laughs> yes, exactly. They've got it already. <laughs> okay. Now uh, you're talking about your uh, novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. Now it's been what almost ten years, I believe, right? Yeah. So. Um, how was it an inspiration for Pakistani readers? And uh, and a, according to you, how much has it actually impacted the youth? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it's difficult to say how much things, you know, impact uh, uh, things. So, uh, you know, how much a novel impacts society. And the way I think of storytelling, the way I think of novels in particular, is that, you know, writing fiction is a little bit like kind of, you know, venture capital. It's the startup mm -hmm. world of storytelling. You know, to make a big film or television show, you need, you know, uh, billions of rupees or millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You need hundreds of people. You need all this sort of stuff. Um, whereas to make a book, one person just sits by themselves for a couple of years, or in my case, you know, five or six or seven years, um, and, and write something. And then, of course, a publishing company has to publish it, etc. But it is nowhere near the kind of cost or or um, uh, you know, number of people, et cetera, involved mm -hmm. as in, in film. So what then happens is we get to have these new kind of, you could say, startup ideas, startup stories, little right. experiments. Now, sometimes these experiments have an impact you can't imagine. You know, it's not just that did 10,000 people spend, you know, or 10 million people spend uh, uh, six or eight or 10 hours with your book. And, you know, you can say that this many eyeballs times this amount of engagement resulted in this amount of attention. It could also be one reader reads your book mm -hmm. and that one reader does something interesting. They start a school, they found a political party, um, they make a movie, they um, uh, become a prime minister or a principal or a school teacher. Um, and so it's very difficult to know 
what these stories actually do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the one thing I will say is though that I've been very engaged recently, for example, in trying to make sure that there are local, low price Pakistani editions of all of my books available. And that process mm-hmm. is now finally uh, sort of becoming complete. So in the next nice. couple of weeks, the last of my books will be available in a low cost Pakistani edition. Mm-hmm. And what I find when I go onto university campuses or schools in Pakistan is that many young people have read the work. How many, you know, how pervasive, what percentage of the population, I don't know. And I'm not even that pushed, you know, if more people watch Netflix's Stranger Things than read my books, that's fine. Yeah. But if one or two children or one or two young people or one or two old people read the book and find something in it that's useful for, to them, then, you know, my job is done. Mission accomplished. Right. Now, uh, your work, Exit West, now it was quite popular and it raised, uh, raised quite a number of questions about, you know, the West and its uh, immigration policies. Now, you yourself have, uh, you know, you have spent your childhood in USA, from what we know, and then obviously in Pakistan and then, you know, in, in UK. Now, even though you had an educated and well-settled background, you know, and as an immigrant, how closely were you connecting yourself with Nadia? You know, you're having the experience that you had uh, with Nadia and Saeed. Um, and uh, Nadia and Saeed, are they, you know, um, are they being, um, uh, how do I say that? Are they based on some real life uh, people or experiences that you have? Well, they're, they're not really, the characters weren't really based on, it's not that Nadia was so-and-so and Saeed was so-and-so and I changed their names to make them into characters. I think the way that I write characters it's a bit like an actor playing a role. So when I write a character, I imagine, what is it like to be this person? What would I do? What would I feel like? What would I be like? Mm-hmm. And so each, in both the case of Nadia and Said, I imagined you know, two different types of young people. Said mm-hmm. is the type of young person you can imagine if you went to university outside of your hometown. Um, and when you get there, one kind of young person is desperate to find people from the hometown to set up a group of friends who come from your old place, you can get together, listen to the old music, tell the old stories, have the old food, hang out and be comfortable. And Sayed has that kind of impulse, an impulse to look to the past, a kind of nostalgic impulse. Nadia, on the other hand, is somebody who wants to move into the future. She's desperate to put the past behind her. She's somebody who, when they move to university, they change their accent, they change their hair, they change everything about themselves, meet new friends and reinvent themselves. Now, I think, both of these instincts in, exist in all of us. You know, sometimes all of us want to look back. Sometimes all of us want to look forward. And even in, say, the Nadia's case, they also each have, say, has a little bit of the looking forward and Nadia has a little bit of the looking back. But, but in a sense, I took these two different impulses, you know, that I felt were very strong in me. One, the desire upon leaving home to be somebody new. And one, the desire upon leaving home to get back home somehow. And, and I took those two impulses and I guess made these characters from those impulses. Nice. Now, uh, even in a, uh, uh, the novel, it shows a dark part of London. So what are your views on you know, the best treatment of migrants? And uh, do you think there's a contradiction between what they are practicing and preaching? Um, how, how does it feel, basically, what I'm trying to ask is, how does it feel to be a, a brown man showing a mirror to the white world through his writings? Well, I think, um, look, I think that, uh, uh, you know, in, in South Asia and countries like Pakistan and India, you know, it's not that, that we have some amazing record of treating migrants very well. Um, so, you know, it's not that it's not that uh, the problem of migrants being treated badly is a uniquely Western phenomenon. I think it's a human phenomenon. You know, all over the world, we see that when people move across borders, there's a resistance and a reaction to that board, uh, that move. Mm. Um, but, but I think what's different in a way about the West is that in the West, the conversation for so long was about universal values. You know, all human beings are created equal. We all have the same rights. We believe in democracy. Now, um, if you say those things, then when a migrant comes, in a way, a certain hypocrisy is exposed, right? If you don't say those things, you say, we don't believe in democracy. We are a country for our people. You know, we are the best. Hell with the people right. who are different. Um, that's problematic, but it's not necessarily hypocritical. Um, I think I think I think the difference is that in in many um, other countries you have equally bad treatment of migrants, but it's not hidden behind this kind of veil of hypocrisy in a way. Mm-hmm. In the West, what happens is there is this veil of hypocrisy, which I think is yeah. now starting to be torn down. You know, Donald Trump no longer says 
Uh, in fact, we found Donald Trump, Trump shocking because he said things that no other American president has said for a very long time. But those things that he was saying to a certain extent reflect underlying truths, that there is racism in America. There is a desire for people to be here, to be different from those who come. There is a feeling that maybe uh, third, fourth, fifth generation Americans or white Americans are somehow superior to more recent superior Americans. Superior to it. Yeah. And so I think in a way, what we're seeing is, is the tearing down of a kind of veil of hypocrisy. Now, what happens after that is the question. And I think there, whether you live in a place like Pakistan or India or, or, or Dubai, or you live in uh, London or New York or, or, or France or Germany, um, the question we're all facing is the same, which is, um, can we have a kind of nostalgic politics successfully? You know, can we go back to the classical age of Islam or Hinduism before the Muslims arrived in South Asia or um, Russia in its great days or, or, or Turkey in its great days or America when it was more white or Britain when it was less European. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can go back to those things. I think the project to go back to those things is very dangerous. I think it's much better to imagine a future that's inclusive that we, that we can get to. So in many ways, my project was a project to try about to look at that future. Can we find a future that looks at this migration apocalypse and asks the question of maybe it won't be so bad. Maybe it won't be an apocalypse. Maybe something better is possible. Now, uh, what you just said, Ani, is that the solution that you're seeing? And I understand that divide in society about, you know, that you have color, you have race, caste, and, you know, it has been a permanent feature almost of all societies, you know, we agree on that. And uh, the last white man, this actually is addressing that divide in the society, you know, you know on skin color, yeah, right? So do you think what you just explained is the solution? I, I don't think I have the solution. I think what happens in societies is that they change. Um, you know, Pakistan is very different now in 1971 uh, than it was in 1971 when I was born. And it was very different 1971 than it was in 1947, you know, when my parents were born. Um, and when my grandparents were born in what was then British India in the early 1900s, it was very different again. Now, I don't think it changes just because, you know, people become wiser. I think societies and cultures also change because one generation dies and a new generation is born. And each generation looks at the world a little bit differently. So to a certain extent, we change. But to a certain extent, we also pass and the next thing comes. And so I, as a novelist and a storyteller, I suppose it's less that I say, I'm saying that, oh, this is the solution. Instead, I think what I'm saying is we can try to imagine differently. And if we imagine differently, it may be that new dreams are born. And out of those new dreams, we find a better way forward. I'm not saying that sort of my, I have the answers to everything. What I'm saying is I'm offering an invitation to imagine differently. And then to see if, you know, that imagining differently has an effect on our generation and the generations that follow. Now, even in Pakistan, you're talking about, you know, the generation uh, out there. Now, in Pakistan, there have always been two classes. You have the elite and you have the lower, middle, or the poor. You know, that is more prevalent out there, right? Now, uh, the existence of middle class, especially in a place like, let's say, India. Yeah. Now, in Pakistan, it has been quite minimal, right? What is the reason you think that, you know, or don't you think that, you know, middle class would be helpful for a country's economy and growth? Or is this the genera you know, the, is this the gap that we are looking at where the generations are not able to understand? Uh... So I I've heard this characterization before that India has a large middle class and Pakistan does not have a large middle class. I don't know if it's true. So the interesting thing about it is that, um, uh, I mean, if you live in Lahore, where I spend you know, much of my time, it's obvious there's a very large middle class in the whole. You know, if you if by elite you sort of mean you know the the top one percent sort of of rich people, right? Um, the number of people whose parents uh, walked on foot and now have bicycles, or whose parents now have had bicycles and now they have motorcycles, or whose parents had motorcycles and now they have automobiles, or whose parents didn't go to university and now they've gone to university, is enormous, right? right. Um, so so Lahore is full of people who have moved up. The social ladder and Lahore is a city of 12 million people. Karachi quite similarly. So um, I think you know the the idea that there isn't a mis middle class is a bit of a of a misconception. And now the question is, what is the power of that middle class? 
Um, and what kind of uh, uh, effect does that middle class have on shaping society? I think what you're seeing is, is a growing power, in fact, of that middle class in Pakistan. So nobody can resist you know, the force of what the TV channels are saying because middle class people have televisions and they watch it. You know, the appeal that, for example, Imran Khan is making um, is a middle class appeal over social media to young people, you know, spread on WhatsApp and on Twitter. Um, and, and, you know, the role of, of the army and what the army can do is very much circumscribed by the fact that, you know, many young people in the army are from the middle class and their families belong to the middle class. And there's emerging a growing sort of middle class, you know, uh, a center in Pakistan. So Pakistan is no longer a country of a large rural poor and a tiny urban elite and their servants. Um, Pakistan is a country with many tens of millions of middle class people. Um, now, how big the Indian middle class is compared to Pakistani middle classes, I actually don't know. Uh, it's hard for me to really give you an estimate of that. But, um, but I don't get the feeling in Lahore or Karachi that these are not very largely middle class cities. Um, they do have a large middle class in the same way that, that Bombay or, or Delhi have, have large middle class. Um, but I, but I, think that, I think that historically speaking, there are reasons why the middle class has had less power in Pakistan. Above all, because democracy is less well established in Pakistan and the middle class has been less able to, uh, you know, control, have, have effect to the ballot box. But I think it's changing. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I often find uh, when traveling between India and Pakistan is, is that people tend to think the two countries are more different than they are. And in fact, the ways in which they are different are not the ways that you expect. Oh, okay. So uh, now, now, if you were to, uh, I, I won't say, um, give points uh, <laughs> to a country, then as a writer and as a UK-based, uh, no, Pakistan actually based, right? With uh, experience in US and uh, working experience in US and UK, how would you rate uh, Pakistan with what it has achieved these 75 years so, look, I think that I think that um, uh, you know I'm I'm very disappointed in the sense that it's hard to look at where we are now in 2023 and say this has been fantastic. You know, we've achieved all that we wish to achieve, and this has been a great run, right? Um, I think that I think the issue is though uh, when a question like this is asked um, by itself, right? It gives rise to a very dangerous dynamic. So, um, so I can answer and say, look, I'm very disappointed in how Pakistan has done. And of course, there is truth in that answer. But when it's taken out of context, it becomes, oh, look at Pakistan. It's a failure as a country, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and if I were to say, oh, well, you know, Pakistan has done well in this and that and the other, then of course, that becomes a kind of exercise in, in sort of propaganda and trying propaganda. to sort of say, oh, you know, the country is doing well. I, I'm not a big fan of, of rating countries in this way, because I think it confuses the fact that Pakistan is 220 million people. You know, it's more than right. any country in Europe. Um, it's more than most countries in Europe put together. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, two thirds the size of America. You know, after, it's the fifth right. biggest country in the world and it's very diverse. So I do not think that Pakistan has delivered on its potential. Um, I think that there's enormous uh, problems and things to be concerned about. Yeah. Um, but I also don't like the idea of sort of saying that, you know, oh, Pakistan is some failure and other countries are doing much better and what's wrong with Pakistan. Um, I think that 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 feeds into a very dangerous narrative. I think the real question is, how can Pakistanis do better? And it's very, yeah. very clear that Pakistan needs to do very much better um, than it has done so far. So focusing on the solution. Focusing on the solution and, and, and focusing if we are going to focus on critique on, on critiques of specific things. You know, not to say a country is a failure or a success. Um, I, I think that that's dangerous because, you know, in a way, that kind of language is, is, is weaponized so easily. You know, if Afghanistan is a failure, we should invade Afghanistan. If Pakistan is a failure, we should do this mm -hmm. to Pakistan. I don't think that's right. You know, is America a failure now compared to what it was 20 years ago? Who knows? Um, I think the bigger question is, um, is Pakistan failing to provide a kind of education health services, social services, law and order, uh, to the extent that it should be. Um, and I think there the answer is it needs to um, uh, change its direction. You know, we'll see. I think we are in a bit of a crisis at the moment 
and it's too soon to see what happens after that crisis. So, so I'm worried about Pakistan. I'm concerned about Pakistan, but I don't like language that suggests that Pakistan is is sort of a failure as a country. That's right. I'm wishing Pakistan all the luck on this also. <laughs> now, uh, coming back to the books, uh, we understand in in the Asian community, unlike the UK and the US and all other you know European countries, also reading is uh, you know quite predominant over there. So it's like uh, picking up a book, you know, going to the park, reading over there at the beach, and even you know after you switch off the lights. Right before sleeping, that time. So you have this reading culture very predominant, but not in the you know in the Asian you know community. Now, add to that you have the social media and even the prevalence of uh, mobile and internet that polluting the youth further. Right now, earlier books were the reference points, but now social reach is a reference point. So what do you think about that? Well, I think you know technology changes. Right, storytelling will always yeah. be. To human civilization. It always has been. You know, before we had books and before we had movies, we sat on a fire at night and spoke to our cousins and our clan mm -hmm. and told stories at night. And we will always do that, whether that's around on around a screen or whether that's with a book or something else. Now, um, I think that uh, what books do though remains very special. And it, it, I don't know if books were ever read that widely. You know, it's not that the number of books read on planet Earth has gone down. Other things have gone up. But, you know, books, yeah. I mean, there are more books read in Pakistan in 2023 than there were in 1953, you know, for sure, by a factor of, you know, probably many hundreds. Uh, in Lahore, where, you know, uh, I spend much of my time, um, there are, you know, universities with hundreds of thousands of students currently enrolled. There's probably half a million university students in Lahore, or at least two or three hundred thousand. You know, there's more university students in, in Lahore than probably in Boston, you know, maybe even in London. Who knows? Um, these young people read. Now, how many of them read novels, how often they read novels is a good question, but some of them do. And, um, and so, uh, so I don't think, I think that, you know, what we're seeing is that um, people are using text to communicate. They're writing text to, to communicate. Right. So the young people are becoming part of a writing and reading culture, even if that writing and reading culture is not about the novel. Um, but once they enter into that culture, which they weren't before, you know, before this mobile phone, everybody texting, many fewer people mm -hmm. were writing and reading on a daily basis. Now, almost everybody seems to be. Um, so the link between that and a culture where you read the newspaper or you read a novel is, I think, fairly strong. Now, what's special about the novel, I think, is that when you read a novel, uh, unlike when you watch a TV show or you watch a film, uh, a film or TV show looks like the world. You're just a viewer of something that looks like True. the world. True. A book is just these letters and characters on a blank page. And you make that into people yeah. and emotions and images. The reader is creating the book alongside. The book. And so I think for me, books are more like being invited to play make-believe with your best friend when you're five years old. You both decide mm -hmm. to pretend that we're, we're, we're world-class cricketers or we are astronauts, sure. you know, or we're policemen or whatever. And... Um, and so, and so you enter this game, or we're dinosaurs, you know, or we're, mm -hmm. or we're having a tea party. And children do this all the time. And as adults, we stop doing this. But when we read books, we do it again. And some people will always be drawn to and attracted to that. So I think it's less that there isn't a reading culture. I think that nowhere in the world is the reading culture, you know, the kind of thing where everybody is reading these literary fiction and they're all discussing. It's always been a minority kind of a taste. Um, but that minority taste is growing in South Asia and the number of people doing it is also growing. So the number of books that they are reading is growing quite largely. So are you a small part of how people spend their time? Yes. A very small part? Yes. But is that still a growing thing? I think yes. Yeah, so there's hope left. Absolutely. There's always hope. And, and you know, I mean, uh, if you think about Lahore, for example, right? Um, the great shrines in Lahore are the shrines to poets who have been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years. And to even now, people come and sit there, pray there, um, ask for help or enlightenment or just spend time there yeah. after centuries. You know, sometimes in the West, um, people will say, oh, well, you know, what's it like being a writer in Pakistan? Imagining it's some terrible thing. And of course, there are you know different uh, situations you know involving freedom of expression or security in Pakistan. But that said, 
in the West, you know, people often ask, oh, well, you know, how did your book sell? You know, what, award, what awards did you win? In Pakistan, if you tell somebody you're a writer, nine times out of 10, what they'll say to you is, mashallah, you know, mm -hmm. how wonderful. That's a great thing to be doing. It's as though you're doing a service for humanity. And I don't think that we should underestimate that. The respect that people have for writers is a beautiful thing in this part of the world. And it goes back for many centuries. Now, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned about the, uh, the spirituality, uh, spiritual part of it. Now, even in your novels, your protagonist always, you know, they kind of turn spiritual in the end. Uh, why is that? I mean, many authors, they create their own personas, right? And their characters. So yeah. Is this the case in your book too? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I do come from a tradition. That the, I mean, I come from different traditions, but one of the traditions I feel very much part of, uh, you know, as somebody from Lahore, but just also in terms of, you know, we grew up listening to Qawalis and hearing poetry and, and the right. Sufi poets and stuff. Um, the idea that, you know, that there is a spiritual side to literature, that there is wisdom to be gained from love stories, that, um, that, that the human condition is something that, um, that literature allows us to get close to but in, in, a, in an almost mystical way, is you know, very much part of my upbringing. And so my first novel, Moth Smoke, was called Moth Smoke because you know, one of the great images in Sufi poetry is the moth and the flame of the candle. Mm -hmm. And so that novel begins, in a way, with a Sufi right. image. And, um, and, and, you know, and most of my books subsequently, in, in a sense, they have had many different strands that come through them. You know, the modernist writers of the 20th century um, uh, some of the great writers of, of, of you know, the African-American tradition, um, mm -hmm. some of my favorite, you know, Asian uh, writers or African writers, all have shaped me. But, but I think the Sufi poetic tradition has been one of the things that has shaped me the most. Uh, and so it is present, I suppose, in its own way in all of my books. Interesting. That, that's amazing. Now, uh, coming back to the Lit Fest, yeah, the Emirates Literature Festival. Now, you're one of the brilliant authors who will be attending it. Uh, what made you part of it? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I was asked. I think uh, uh, there's, what I tend to do is when a, um, a book of mine uh, comes out, um, the year after that, I tend to travel a lot uh, and go to many different places. And so I, I think of my life as, you know, um, I spend four or five years like a like a sort of a like a mole, you know, in, in the ground, uh, mm -hmm. in my little cave, uh, which is the study you see all around me, just sitting in there all by myself writing. And then every four or five years, I finish a book and then I'm pulled out of the cave into the sunlight <laughs> and I sort of look around blinking okay. and go back in. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I've been to Dubai many times. Um, I have many friends there. You know, Dubai is one of the great cities of the South Asian diaspora, you know, alongside uh, New York and London, you know, Toronto. Um, so many, you know, Pakistanis, Indians, Bangladeshis, Sri Lankans, Nepalis live in live in uh, live in Dubai. For many people, it's it's like a second home, and it's close to Lahore. And so I've I've had I've long had a connection to the place, and it is I think a, a great crossroads. And uh, and so and so I'm very happy to come and 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 to speak and to talk about my books. Excellent. So you'll be having two sessions, I believe, at the Lit Fest. So obviously you are, you've come out, you'll be coming out of your intellectual hibernation, if I would call it so. Yeah. So what do you think the key, you know, takeaways uh, for the audience will be for, from these sessions? Well, I think, you know, if, if I could give you the key takeaways, I, there'd be no reason to do the events. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I, so um, I, I think that one of the sessions will be to do uh, more with the experience of migration and writing and politics. Um, and it'll be a panel. And I believe that in, in that session, you know, we'll explore things about what is it to be a writer who's lived in different places or writes about people who move between different places. Right. What is the political power of fiction? Um, what is the personal impact uh, of fiction on a migrant? Um, and we'll explore those types of themes. And the second one will be a conversation really around the white, the last white man primarily. And, and I think my writing in general, but mostly that book. Um, and it'll be a way to talk about, you know, what the book is trying to do and what I was trying to do with it. Um, as far as the takeaways, you know, that that's something that every every uh, listener will decide from themselves. I hope there'll be something. But but I, I think, you know, it's also not just a matter of, of takeaways. Um, we uh, so often wind up inside our own little bubbles talking. 
festivals is you can get outside of that bubble. You can hear people who have different points of view. You can expose yourself to different kinds of conversations. And that applies not just to my sessions. I think it applies to every session that would be happening at the festival. So, so, um, so I think in a sense, it's a place to come and have experiences uh, in the same way that we used to have experiences when we walked into a library and you sort of found a book on the shelf, as opposed to now when an algorithm suggests you a book, which is just like the book you just, you, you know, you, you've already read. Excellent, excellent. Austin Hammond, thank you very much for being on the show. It was a true pleasure. Mine too. Thank and, you. And uh, hopefully we'll be seeing you out here. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Like and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell icon to get notification from the Brew News.